compliant mechanisms are one of the most satisfying things to play with, but they can also be very functional too. Today, we explore the best tips for designing and 3D printing your own. Compliant mechanisms are truly amazing, but there's no reason we need to be stuck as mere observers. We can design and make them ourselves. In this video, I'll share with you some tips for doing just that. My patron Jeff requested a guide on this late last year, and it's finally here. But before the tips, first, a definition. I think most people have an implicit understanding of what a mechanism is. But technically, a mechanism is a device that transforms input forces and movements, does something with them, giving us output forces and movement. Here is a simple example of a mechanism we can all relate to, a set of pliers. On one side, we have our handles, that counts as the input. Then we have a pivot and our jaws on the other side. And thanks to the length of the handles versus the jaws, we have a mechanical advantage, which means the real output is our scream when we squeeze our finger. So how does a compliant mechanism differ? Well, instead of having joints, it's flexible and works through deformation. This set of tweezers is a compliant mechanism that we're probably already familiar with. It's made from one piece and it relies on the flex of the material to close, creating an output based on the input of the user's hands. Not enough of an output to get that scream, so instead let's introduce the compliant plier mechanism from the Wikipedia page. Again, this one is all one piece and relies on deformation for movement and to create mechanical advantage. Now the opening's not that large and it is hard to get your finger in, so it's questionable to use this on adults, but for small children, I guarantee you, you'll get your scream. So in summary, where traditional mechanisms are made from multiple pieces joined together with bolts and bearings to facilitate movement, a compliant mechanism is designed to be one piece from the very beginning and rely on flexing to allow movement and achieve the intended purpose. Compliant mechanisms are pretty popular on YouTube because they're so satisfying to watch. Previously, I made this video where inspired by a wooden laser cut glasses box, I took to CAD and used linear patterns to create a similar formation and I released these patterns so anyone could import them as a modifier into their slicer and add bendy segments to otherwise rigid objects printed with a rigid filament. But you've probably seen much more popular videos like this one from Veritasium that offered a deep dive on compliant mechanisms and their applications. This video from RC Life On, where Simon used a compliant mechanism for thrust vectoring on an RC flying wing. And more recently, this viral video by Mark Rober where he collaborated to create the world's smallest Nerf gun using a compliant mechanism. There's something these three videos and these pliers all have in common. They were all designed by the Compliant Mechanism Research Lab at Brigham Young University. According to these videos, Larry Howe, the chief professor, literally wrote the book on compliant mechanisms. And in part because of this, BYU CMR are famous for their compliant mechanisms and they have some great resources on their website. Here we can see the One Piece Blaster from the Mark Rober video, the pliers from the Veritasium video, and the Two Degree of Freedom Space Pointer from the RC Life On video. This is a fantastic resource for learning. There's numerous files that you can download for free, print for yourself, and see exactly how they work. If you look hard enough, you will find examples of compliant mechanisms in objects around your house. But trust me, it's much more satisfying to learn by making some yourself which is why it's no surprise that most of the objects we're about to explore are from BYU CMR. The aim here is to examine a range of compliant mechanisms and then identify some rules for making our own. We'll start off with those same pliers designed by BYU CMR. If we examine them, we can see they have three points of deformation, which are the equivalent of hinges, one, two, and three. And if you watch them carefully, this is where the movement comes from as the handles are pushed and the jaws open and close. This bistable switch is designed in a very similar way. When we push down on one of the levers, it snaps into a held position, and that's because this is an over-center mechanism, which is why it doesn't like holding this position, and once past the center point, pushes and locks into the new stable position. So how about the One Piece Compliant Nerf Blaster? This one's a little bit different, and it's actually made up of two mechanisms. The first of those is the trigger, and that's designed to rotate when you pull your finger on it, we can see there's two parts of plastic that deform for this. And then we have the second mechanism, which this time is linear and is activated by pulling back on the finger plunger. That will then lock the plunger against the trigger. And we can see in these springs, we have a lot of stored energy. If we now load in a dart and then pull the trigger, 
That stored energy is released and the dart becomes a projectile. How about something completely different, 3D printed origami. This looks like a flower, but is actually a flasher hexagon. I don't know what that means and I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments. What I do know is that it folds like origami to have two states, and that playing with it is quite satisfying. There's a video on the printables page showing you how to make all of these creases, and if we shine a light from underneath, we can see that much of the plastic is thick, but these sections that are designed to crease are purposely kept thin at around 0.2mm. STST on printables has quite a lot of experiments with compliant designs, including this Spiral Spring 23. This one has multiple applications and again is very satisfying to play with. Firstly, if we rotate the center separately to the outside, it acts like a torsion spring, storing energy and then releasing it. And this is evident whichever way we rotate it. But then, if we turn it on its side, we can see that it also acts as a vertical linear spring as well. And not only that, furthermore, we can rotate it from side to side, giving this quite a few degrees of freedom. Remember that this is a rigid filament, but it's designed to make the final product compliant. You might remember a fractal vise that I designed my own version of in a video previously. It can articulate to conform to almost any shape, but in doing so, it has a lot of moving parts and complexity. So instead, here is a compliant mechanism version by Bubs Builds. The aim, of course, is the same, to make a flexure that can deform when pressed and therefore contour to the shape of almost any object. Instead of many moving parts, we instead have one made up of multiple segments with thin sections that are designed to flex. And it does do this pretty well. It's not as mesmerizing as the other fractal vice, in part because this version is a little bit stiff, but more on the print settings to avoid that later. And finally, my own bendable pieces, which you can find on printables. These are again printed in a rigid filament, but anywhere where the pattern is applied, they become quite flexible, to the point where they have multiple degrees of freedom. These work great in torsion, traditional bends, a combination of the two, and they'll even work with a limited capacity in compression and tension. Onto the rules, and we start by answering the most important question, and that is, what is the best material for 3D printing compliant mechanisms? When you find compliant mechanisms in plastic consumer products, it's most likely in the form of this, a living hinge as seen on the top of this jar. This is another over-center mechanism that likes to snap into one position or the other, and typically these will be injection molded from polypropylene plastic, but PP is very uncommon in the world of 3D printing. So you might think the next best bet is to use TPU, a purposely flexible filament. But as we can see here on this bistable switch, it won't actually lock into position and therefore it won't function as intended compared to the rigid filament. And that's because TPU is typically too flexible. It does have memory and wants to return to its original position, but it's not particularly responsive in doing so. Previously, in this model, I designed some compliant mechanism springs to act as a suspension. And they do work, but they highlight another problem with TPU. Over time, it can deform permanently. Here's the car with the body on, and as you can see, the suspension has sagged and killed all of the wheel clearance. This used to roll nicely, but now it's just jammed. Another popular filament is PLA, and you might have some success with this depending on the design of the mechanism. I picked this bi-stable switch for back-to-back -back testing because the middle joint needs to flex quite a bit, and that makes it quite demanding. And this exposes PLA's weakness. It can be fairly brittle. And as we can see here, one of the joints has snapped after not too many cycles. If we examine the remaining joint, we can see that it's white, damaged, and was probably going to break soon too. I think probably the best filament choice is nylon, as it has a small amount of flex without being anywhere near as floppy as TPU. This switch still locks into the position that it should, yet it doesn't feel too rigid and like it's going to fail. And I have run this version through many, many cycles, and it shows no signs of failure anytime soon. But here's the thing about nylon, it's one of the hardest filaments to print. It needs to be kept really dry, and if printed without an enclosure, and sometimes when printed with one, it likes to deform and peel up off the bed. So with this in mind, are there any close alternatives? This version is printed with the same settings, but in ASA. It's got a satisfying snap to the motion, and so far it has survived many cycles without any damage. But there is a little bit of discoloration in the flex points, suggesting that it won't last forever. So not as good as nylon, better than PLA, and for many people, still hard to print unless you have an enclosure. So here's my best compromise, PETG. The switch has a satisfying snap action, and I've been through many cycles without the joint failing. And we can see up close that there's not the decoloration from permanent deformation. 
I still don't think that it's reliable as nylon, but given how much easier it is to print, I think it's a fantastic compromise. Everything you see here, apart from the blue pliers, is printed in PETG to great effect. How about some more tips? First up, let it cool before bending, i.e. using the mechanism. Compliant mechanisms are so much fun to play with, but don't rush in as soon as they've finished printing. Or you may risk breaking them without breaking them. Consider a thin print. If you've ever tried to peel it off before it had cooled down, you might have noticed that once it did, it would stay permanently deformed, and with these prints, we don't want to risk permanent deformation ruining our mechanism. When in the slicer, check and control your seams. You'll notice in this print that by default, it's trying to put the seam in the skinniest part, and that happens to be the section that we need to flex and remain reliable when it bends. If you don't address this, probably the first time you use the mechanism, it's going to snap. Every slicer has a way for you to manually position seams. The handiest here is probably paint on seams, and you should paint them near but not on the skinny junction that deforms. You then need to double check that the junction has consistent extrusions. On a similar note, arachne perimeters may be problematic. We can see here that we have arachne perimeters on, and when we slice the model, previewing by line width shows that there's some variation across this junction. Based on my experience in making this video, this can be quite problematic. Without changing anything else, if we switch to classic and then re-slice, we can actually see that this section was too thin for the extrusion to actually take place. Using arachne perimeters will hide this, but it does make for a weaker joint in some cases. This print looks okay, but the first time we change the mechanism, we hear a small crack and have a partial failure, and now it no longer clicks into position. To get around this, if it's someone else's model, the simplest thing you can do is to scale it up. This will hopefully then give the junction enough width that you can get full width extrusions, which will hopefully make for a reliable mechanism. With this in mind, if you're designing the mechanism yourself, you want to match the bendy sections to extrusion width multiples. Your slicer should have a section with your line widths. These are the widths of each extrusion as they're laid down. Probably the ones we're concerned with the most are outer wall and perhaps default. And in this profile, they're each set to 0.42 millimeters. So let's say we're designing a mechanism with a thin section that we want to bend. Right from the start, we should go in knowing exactly how many perimeters we want across this section. One perimeter means an extrusion on each side, so two in total, we can do a simple calculation to work out just how wide this bit should be. And then we can come into the sketch and alter accordingly. If I think this looks a little bit skinny and I'd like to add more perimeters, the next step up would be two, which makes four in total. So once again, I can size my geometry to suit. This calculated approach should save you headaches later on. Related to this, we can tune the amount of flex with our perimeter quantity. Remember that vice flexure that I printed too stiff? If we look at the G-code, we can see that that was printed with three perimeters all around. And the thicker the plastic, the stiffer it's going to be. By simply lowering this to two perimeters, we should be able to increase the flexibility of the mechanism. And conversely, by upping the amount of perimeters, we can stiffen it. And I did exactly this on this compliant spring, with thin, medium, and thick from left to right. The spring on the left is a lot softer, and the one on the right, as you would expect, is stiffer. One of the key principles when designing your own compliant mechanisms is to add length to ensure durability. And the reason I picked this bi-stable switch as my torture test is because it doesn't follow this principle. Here's the initial state, and we can highlight the starting angle in green. And here's the secondary state, again with the angle highlighted in green. Let's start by removing the image, and then enlarge the two, before finally aligning them where we can measure an angle of 40 degrees. This is how much that middle joint has to flex each time we take it between the two positions. And 40 degrees isn't huge, but the problem comes from the fact that that flexing takes place over only around two millimeters. Here's a length of old brittle PLA to demonstrate this principle. If we have a big curve, we can bend it right back on itself, 180 degrees, and we can do this all day. However, if we try for that same angle over a shorter length, the filament will soon fail. The key is to spread out the bends over a longer distance. Here are three mechanisms that have the same job. Flex the two handles together. On this first one, the length of the flexing is quite short. It's likely to fail. On the second one, we extend it, and this one should last much better. And on the third one, we're spreading out the bending over this entire length, so this one will last the longest. We can see examples of this on the blaster trigger. Notice how long the bending segments are. We can also see it on these flexi panels. Each small segment only needs to move a couple of degrees, but the sum of all of this is a large range of movement. But the best example is the spiral spring. 
as each length is really long, wrapping around and around the center, and that makes this mechanism reliable. Another quick design tip, fillets fend off fatigue. If we come back to our last example, obvious weak points are these square edges. So the easy solution for this is to just add fillets in any corners near points that bend. This will stop the stress from concentrating in the sharp corners. And finally, we can multiply geometry to add strength and force. That spiral spring has a surprising amount of energy that it can store. And that because it doesn't just have one spiral around the outside, it's actually got three, each starting in the center and anchoring around the perimeter. But the best example of this is the blaster. Each of those sections that start straight and then have a curve when recoiled work in harmony and the reason there's so much force built up is because there's 12 of them. When designing, you can multiply the same geometry to increase the force. Let's say we're in this piece a lot stiffer, but we don't want to make the top section too thick. Another solution for this is to just multiply the geometry. And with this configuration, you're going to need a lot more force and therefore have a lot more spring thanks to the multiple arches. For me, 3D printing is the near perfect manufacturing technique for making compliant mechanisms. Firstly, it's easy to iterate. Secondly, we have a lot of control over the slicer settings and therefore the output. And finally, compared to something like laser cutting, we can vary the thickness over the object. I hope the tips in this video will help you if you plan to design or print your own. I'm currently using them in my own project where I want an opening to be closed kind of like a roller door. It's my hope that I can create a part that flexes to follow a curve but then can compress and act like a spring when one part is rotated. More design and testing needed, but you will see this in future. Thanks Jeff for making the video request. Thank you BYU CMR for all of your great designs. And thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy 3D printing compliant mechanisms. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.